So I've seen quite a few of you have actually written down the diagrams. So we looked at the top-down approach. Someone has put the top-down approach has four stages. Six. Can we correct it? How many stages? Six stages. In the lesson, we covered three in detail as a class. And remember, I gave you the worksheet to read the remaining three and to create sentences out of it. So it does have six stages. The first stage is what? Profile input. Profile input. The second stage is? Decision process model. And who can tell me what happens in that particular stage? Organize the data into meaningful patterns, yeah? So we use the example of if someone was murdered around the corner from the gym, look at, do they actually attend that gym? What's their routine like? The person who murdered them, what would their business be in that area? Okay, and the third stage that we looked at in the class was something called crime assessment. And we looked at what type of offenders? And disorganized. And you guys did that fun activity of designing the characteristics, which is great. So we've got the crime scene analysis that starts first with both the top-down approach and the bottom-up approach. So what happens in the top-down approach? What makes a difference to the bottom-up approach? You rely on the profiler's opinion more than data. Yeah, so you start off with the profiler's opinion, their intuition more than data, and then the bottom-up approach says what? Jenny? They use data from that database to Perfect, so it goes from empirical data up to the profiler. Bottom-up approach to profiling. And our main researcher for the bottom-up approach is a guy called David Cantor. David Cantor. So you know when you studied attachment last year, who's your lady for attachment? Ainsworth. So whenever you hear bottom-up approach, you think Cantor. Yeah? This is something that the examiners want you to know. Obviously you don't know him in real life, but there is research. Yeah. With the bottom-up approach, there are two main types. The first one, which we touched on a little bit towards the end of our lesson, is investigative psychology. And the second one is geographical profiling. So under investigative psychology, there are three steps. And the first one that we touched on last week is interpersonal coherence. Now that word coherence is when things actually tie in together, they correlate with each other. So you're looking at the correlations between the crime and the offender's behaviour. So the crime that was committed, was it murder, was it rape, was it burglary? And correlating that with the offender's general behaviour. So you would expect perhaps someone who's um, been convicted of serial rapes, you would expect that perhaps there's interaction with women in everyday life, they may not have that much interaction, therefore that's why they've gone on to rape. Remember what we said last week about how an organised offender in terms of the characteristics that constitute an organised offender, one of them is the fact that they are able to conceal evidence. So they're able to conceal fingerprints, they're able to move the body from one place to another. That is something that the investigative psychology field calls forensic awareness. So if you're able to find out, okay, this suspect seems to be forensically aware about the procedures that we would follow to catch them, i.e. looking for fingerprints, i.e. looking for blood, looking for semen, that helps us to profile them as someone who's quite intelligent. Yeah? So that is the forensic awareness part. Certain behaviours that the suspect produces reveal their profile, their overall profile. Okay, so the smallest space analysis is very similar to interpersonal coherence. The only difference is that with the small space analysis, they make correlations, so they run the correlations, but then they produce underlying themes, as you can see in the research done by Cantor. So that is the difference. It builds upon the interpersonal coherence of just correlating so-and-so's behavior with the crime. But then they now produce underlying themes. So geographical profiling analyzes the spatial relationship between the crime scene and the offender's place of residence. Geographical profiling, how does it actually work? Well, it can be done in two ways. The first way is where you actually know the location of the crime scene. So if you know, I'm going to use a triangle, 
Um, crime scene one. Let's say another one was committed here. Crime scene two. Let's say one was committed here as well. Three. So what they use is they use some... Is your hand up, Simeon? No, okay. okay. What they use is a statistical technique to almost create a spatial area or a potential crime area where they think the offender would move around. And they go, they create this circle based on the theory that offenders work with a spatial mindset and it tends to be circular. That's called, that's the circle theory. So offenders work with a spatial mindset and it tends to be circular. Therefore, if we've got crime scene one, crime scene two, crime scene three, we're assuming that this person is a serial offender. Using this statistical software, they now say, let's find a middle point. And by this middle point, they will draw, this represents 10 kilometers. Based on the circle theory, they now draw a circle. How many of you do maths? So what is this line called? Radius. The radius. God bless you. So this is the radius. And the circle, all the way through, would have a radius of 10 kilometers. Therefore, they would assume that the center represents the um, offender's place of residence. So if they now want to search for the offender, if you come in a little bit closer, let's say this is two kilometers, your search intensity here is going to be so strong in order to find the offender. We're not saying this is their actual location, but we're saying they, they're going to be around that circle. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Yeah. Are we on the same page? Mm -hmm. Glory to God. Seven kilometers. Mm. We'll have another circle. If searching here fails, we'll go a little bit further out. Lower search intensity, but we're cool. Does that make sense? So that's in general how they tend to <laughs> use geographical profiling. However, there's something that we call marauder and commuters. And you can think of it in the sense of the organized and the disorganized offender. The word commuter, who knows what the word commute means? Someone, Someone who travels. So marauder, if we have commuting offenders, people who actually go outside of their usual place of residence, then marauder means they stay, so they commit crimes that are very that are in close proximity to them. So this geographical profiling does account for both of them in a sense that you can start quite close in and you can branch out. So just to give some sort of summary, you know geographical profiling looks at the spatial relationships between the crime scenes and how they might reveal the offender's place of residence. However, it is based on the fact that offenders have a spatial mindset and they tend to work within a circle, according to the circle theory. We've got two types of offenders, marauders and commuters. Marauders tend to commit crimes that are very close to home, close to their place of residence, and commuters tend to commit crimes that are further out. So you can see, when we said that geographical profiling is a circle theory. So surely, with reference to this red search area that they have, does it look like a circle to you? Mm -hmm. No. I don't even know what shape to call it. It's a free-form shape. It's a free-form shape. It's, someone says that it's, it's circular, but it's not quite. What's that blue? Uh, the blue it's perfect circle. So this blue section here and this blue section here are where they thought that he lived. So the place of residence. So remember geographical profiling, crime scenes, and how they reveal the place of re residence. And they all use the dots are the crime scenes. Are the crime scenes like the crime scene, so the houses that he went to steal people's cats. Yes, yes sure. you know the cats that he was stealing, was it like a specific type of cat or was it just random? Sister, but I don't know. How did you know? Yeah, because there were some cats. So this is, so guys, I've shown you this just to cement 
the whole idea that the circle theory isn't necessarily a circle. That is your main evaluation point. I am giving you here. The problem though with this circle theory, because I don't believe that every criminal has a spatial mindset that reflects a circle, in my humble opinion. It could be a triangle or a rectangle. Who came up with the circle theory? So these are some evaluation points. Okay, geographical profiling. Okay, circle theory. But what about those who don't fit the norm? What about individual, individual, individual differences? So even as you pop down circle theory, you put, hmm, is it really a circle? Could be a triangle. And your examiners will be like, okay, I like the way they're thinking outside of the box or outside of the circle. <laughs> In terms of using the bottom-up approach, 75% of detectives found it useful, yeah? But 45% said that they would use it again. So, I'm going to ask, please, Cassie, remember how we unpacked percentages before? So if 75% said they found it useful, what does that tell you? 25% said, said it's not useful. So in as much this is a great study, quite, you know, 48 police forces, the UK isn't that big, so we can say perhaps it's quite representative, we're very standardised in the way that we do things. 75% okay, snaps for you, but 25% weren't feeling it. And then 45% said that they would use profiling again, but then that means 55% wouldn't use it again. So there needs to be research that almost digs a bit deeper. Why don't they want to use it again? What are the errors in it? So this is the case study of John Duffy that I mentioned earlier. He was in his late 20s, hair about 5'9". Um, sorry, his height is about 5'9". Occupation, he's probably semi-skilled, casual labour, and his job probably doesn't bring him into contact with the public. His character, he tends to keep himself to himself. He has one or two very close friends, very little contact with women, especially in a work situation. Um, he's got knowledge of the railway system along which the attacks happened. Sexual activity, his sexual actions suggest considerable experience. This was the first case to have an attempt to have an attempt to use behavioral characteristics to search for the criminal instead of purely forensic evidence from the crime scene. So they went beyond just looking for blood and looking for semen and looking for fingerprints and hair. And in November 2000, John Duffy was convicted and is serving life for the rape and murder of several women. This box here, initially, before the geographical profiling and the behavioural profiling, Duffy was one of 2,000 suspects. However, after the profiling, he became one of two suspects. So you can see how geographical profiling was influential in narrowing down the amount of suspects that we have. It makes the um, criminal profiler's life easier, the police force's life easier. So that's quite a good study to actually know and maybe make mention if ever you have a question on bottom-up profiling.